My name is Laura Helley. I'm with Vision 2020, and uh, we're just going to go through the, um, the project at Westcott uh, for you, and I encourage questions, so um, I'm uh, a little bit more of a casual speaker, so feel free to uh, put your hand up, um, or heck, just shout out a question. Um, this isn't a classroom. You can do those sorts of things. So um, let me go ahead and advance. First, I'll do just a little history of Vision 2020. Um, we got started back in 2011. How many people were here in Austin in 2011? Okay, pretty good chunk. So you might have been following it um, as, as we've gone along. But um, basically what we started with was um, 4,000 ideas from the public on how to improve the community. And um, we shaped those into vision statements um, in 10 different areas. And those were announced in April of 2012. So um, that's perfect. I'm ready. Among those 10 visions, one was for a community recreation center. And so the vision talks about a year-round recreation center, a welcoming place for everyone to meet, exercise, and play, um, state-of-the-art fitness facilities, an aquatic center, practice facilities, um, programs supporting healthy living. So uh, a committee was formed. Uh, the chair is Matt Cano, and the co-chair is Tanya Medgarden. And um, school personnel have been participating in the committee since it formed uh, back in 2012. So we did a needs assessment um, in 2013. And when the public turned in over 4,000 ideas, we, hadn't, we had a clue what the needs were. Um, but by doing a study, we were able to quantify and kind of confirm the common sense um, needs that we had as a community. So the needs that were identified were more indoor recreational space, a covered field for multi-sport usage, year-round recreational activities, especially for kids five and younger, uh, rentable multi-purpose room, and public transportation access to the center. Um, amenities that uh, people were looking for were indoor walking and running space, uh, cardiovascular equipment, group fitness classes, uh, indoor field house with a soccer field, bike trail access with equipment rentals, uh, indoor pool or water park, and community gathering area. So um, from there, we met with the partners in Austin that are already um, working in kind of the recreation and sports area, uh, which was the Riverland Community College, Austin Public Schools, the YMCA, and um, City of Austin Park and Rec. And uh, we really looked at the, the needs and the assets that we already have on the ground and um, decided, do we want to build um, everything on one big campus, or can we... Um, plug some needs into different places. And, and that's where we came to the conclusion that um, the best way to leverage funds was to, to answer some of our community needs at Westcott. So um, our committee approached the district and asked if that was something that we could make happen, and, and that's what we came, came up with this plan. So what is proposed, and uh, I guess what's gonna happen as soon as the, the spring thaw hits, um, is artificial turf added to two fields at Westcott, uh, the football soccer field that's in the stadium and then the uh, field that's inside the track. Um, then there will be a seasonal dome over the football soccer field. It will be up from uh, November to April. Uh, it's a fabric dome and it goes sideline to sideline, so that it does not cover the stands. Um, it's about 70 feet high and then parking uh, for the dome will be under the water tower um, near the um, Family Eye Center there. So there's already some parking there, but they're going to expand that parking lot and, and um, meet the needs, day-to-day -day parking needs there. So here's an image of the dome. You can see that that distinctive architecture of the um, Westcott Stadium that people love is still visible even when the dome is up. And there's snow on the ground because the dome is only going to be up during the winter. In the summer, you'll still um, be able to enjoy all that green space, and um, we will be playing football outdoors um, all fall long. Here's an aerial view. So the turf is going into this field in the middle of the track, and the turf is going into this field inside the stadium. And the, um, when the dome is up, it's inside the stands, and then this is the enhanced parking lot um, with the turnaround loop. So uh, the way this meets community needs, it's more indoor recreational space, it's a covered field for multi-sport usage, indoor walking and running space, indoor soccer field, uh, community gathering space. Go ahead. 
um, the benefits to the community. Artificial turf offers continuous play. You can uh, run a game and a practice and a game and a practice and then have a rainstorm and then have another game because it, even, even a rain event um, is a five or 15 minute recovery at the most. Um, and area teams are already uh, traveling to Rochester and the Metro to play in domes in the winter time so they could stay in Austin. Um, demand for the soccer facilities continues to grow in Austin. Uh, I know I hear from basketball parents that um, they can't get in the gyms because the soccer is using the gyms and so forth and so we know that that's just going to continue. Um, we expect to attract tournaments and other events that will bring in visitors um, which supports tourism and hospitality. In fact, as soon as the announcement hit the papers, organizations started calling the school asking if they could make reservations. So, um, I don't, I don't think that that is uh, too much rose-colored glasses to say we're going to get a lot of visitors. And then the bubble field area is going to be available for open dome hours at no cost to the public. So people will be able to go in there and um, walk or run or just let the toddler run uh, during. The so the timeline, uh, Hormel Foundation has already voted uh, in January uh, to, to provide funds for the project. The school board approved them uh, earlier this month. Um, construction is uh, set uh, for spring 2015, and that way the turf will be in place for fall sports. And then the seasonal dome would first go up in November of 2015. Project costs. It's a um, 5.2 million guaranteed maximum price. Um, it's funded as part of the overall Community Recreation Center uh, package with Vision 2020. Um, and, and as I said, the school uh, is contributing funds and they come from an internal services reserve and Superintendent Krenz will say a little bit more about that. But the school funds are majority state funding that was set aside in this reserve to prevent the state from pulling it back out uh, many years ago. Why is this project a good use of school funds? Um, it eliminates the cost of maintaining grass, and the turf field, as well as the dome, will generate rental revenue. Um, the school will save on the cost of busing athletes for early spring games. Um, I think softball, that typically has to have a couple home games in Rochester at um, the beginning of the season. The school investment of $2.5 million is more than doubled um, by the contributions from the Hormel Foundation. And the facility will serve student athletes it will also serve physical education and the public in general. Okay. You're up. Well, I'm up. I'll go back to this. That's great. So, thanks, Laura. Um, Laura was able to provide uh, quite an overview of the whole project uh, in terms of the dome, but as she indicated, it's just a small part of a bigger project. The total recreation uh, center or concept will be between 40 and 50 million dollars so there's a lot more to come and that's more of a bricks and mortar facility that you'll see and the district's responsibility in that financially will be none so we'll, we'll be gaining more there and i think that's important as laura pointed out we were asked to be a partner in this and uh, as you know uh, or hope you know that since i've come on board we do our due diligence as a district to make sure that our dollars are spent wisely and in appropriate places. Hopefully that was fun, founded as we developed IJ Holton. We spent uh, over two years, almost three years, making sure that this is the right facility, your involvement in planning and making sure we had everything in place. Uh, the calendar committee is another example of we're, we're not just rushing, we're making sure that we're doing the right things for the community and for the school district. So we wanted to make sure that the Vision 2020 group, and particularly the rec center, had done their due diligence. And Laura pointed out, uh, you know, there were thousands of ideas. They surveyed the community, received input from hundreds of individuals on what the community needed and wanted. And we looked at all that and we saw that as a benefit. And I think, uh, you know, they started that in May of 2012 and we're coming up on May of 2015. So they have taken their time and been very patient. And I think that leads to, to something else is 
that those people that are kind of hoping that a rec center and an opportunity for the community comes to fruition, we're getting a little impatient too because they weren't seeing a lot happening. So that's why uh, things developed as quickly as they did. They thought we need to do something to show the community we are moving forward with this. So at that time, the, the foundation came with an offer of 2.7 million if we were able to come up with uh, the two and a half million. And I'll talk a little bit about where that two and a half million has come from. Um, it's important to understand that it's not money that was earmarked for anything else in the district. It's money that the school board several years ago set aside, as Laura pointed out, in, in an internal uh, reserve fund. If you think of it as an individual, you can create a trust fund for yourself. And there's two ways to set up that trust fund. It's money that you put away for a particular purpose. And the board put $3 million away for a particular purpose. It was called OPEP, Other Post-Employment Benefits. Now the state many years ago uh, determined, and, and this was due to a situation with many corporations misusing funds. Uh, most of us remember the Enron scandal, and that's basically where a lot of these accounting practices and laws came into being. So basically, um, what happened is the federal government said you need to start accounting for benefits that you're not paying for at this moment but have to pay for in the future. So the state of Minnesota allowed districts to, to fund those OPEBs in a couple of different ways. One was you can pay as you go, which every district had been doing, most private corporations have been doing it that way. Or in Minnesota you can actually tax the taxpayer, levy a tax to build this fund. In that case, that trust fund would have to be a, a, a reserve fund, um, a, an irrevocable fund that could only be used for that. But if a district chose to still continue to pay as you go, which Austin chose, and then set aside monies uh, on an extra basis, which we had a, a few million dollars set aside at three million, to put in that, you could make that a revocable trust. In other words, you could go in and use that money for other things if you chose to do that. Well, we have done that over the years. That $3 million, even though it is reserved for post-employment benefits, we've been paying for post-employment benefits out of our general fund. We've used it on several occasions in the district um, a few years ago, we're self-insured school district. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but we are. That means we have to set up our own funds. We have to pay uh, medical costs right out of our general fund. Well, a few years ago, we had uh, seen tremendous increases in uses of that fund and we're, we're underfunded by over a million dollars. So rather than taking away, laying off teachers, removing programs, we chose to take a little over a million from this trust fund to offset those costs so we wouldn't have to do that. Didn't have to raise premiums, didn't have to go ask the taxpayers for money. Over the next couple of years, we paid that back, so that money is still there, that three million. Um, last year, or I guess it would have been last year, uh, we used that money to pay for, uh, took money out to pay for the addition or the remodeling at, at Ellis and the remodeling at the Pi Academy at Southgate. And again, we've paid that back um, in this next funding cycle. So that three million is still there. So we thought this would be a perfect opportunity. It's not a, a revenue stream, which we need to uh, continue to support programs, to hire teachers on an ongoing basis. It's basically one-time monies that we can leverage to do these things when opportunities arise. So I wanted to make sure that you understood that. Um, the other thing um, is since I've come also in the last six years, um, philosophically, I believe that facilities are important. You can't have rundown facilities, you can't have unsafe facilities to do your job. 
It's very important that we have quality facilities. And you can see you've got I.J. Holton here to make that happen. Well, in the five and a half years I've been here, not counting the addition at Woodson and this building, we spent over $23 million on facility up upgrades. So this project just kind of fits into that, um, making sure that we have quality facilities across the board. So I want to make sure that you understand that. If you add the, uh, and it doesn't include the addition at uh, Ellis either, the science labs and the gymnasium there. But if you add uh, that and the uh, referendum dollars for IJ Holden, it's almost 70 million in six years for facilities. And I think that's important also, that we're not taken away from anything that we're currently doing or plan to do. The other thing to understand is the turf itself was part of a long, ten, long range 10 year facilities upgrade plan. So it, it was going to happen, it's just how would we pay for it? And there's a couple of ways, again, ways we could have paid for that. One, we could have taxed the taxpayer, or we could have taken it out of general fund money to make that happen. Well, this opportunity with the foundation paying for half of it really provided us to gain much more for half the cost, and we thought that was very important to understand. Now, another question that has come up is, uh, what about the infill on the turf? Many of you might, uh, if you've watched any uh, baseball games played in our official turf, soccer games, uh, football games, uh, as athletes glide across the turf or, or uh, pull their feet across it, you might see this black powdery stuff that comes up. That's not dirt. That's what they call infill. And what the infill is, is ground up rubber and it's rubber from tires, uh, old tires. So uh, that, that's been a little controversial. Uh, some people have tried to tie that with uh, uh, cancer in uh, some young athletes. Uh, we've done our due diligence to make sure that that isn't the case. But we have studied in our study and other opportunities for that. Um, one of the ones that I think is most unusual is there's uh, an infill called coconut. And basically, they take old, they take coconuts, the husks, grind them up, and put that in the infill. You might get a little of the white stuff too, and if you bring your chocolate syrup, you can have a Mounds bar, right? Uh, okay. Uh, another infill is uh, old shoes. It's called Nike infill. And uh, basically, if they've got enough old Nike tennis shoes laying around, it's really not old shoes, it's just shoes they didn't sell. They grind up the rubber, and they'll use that for the infill. The only problem with that is uh, both of those are about a half a million more dollars uh, for the cost. One of the uh, biggest studies done in terms of the old tires being ground up is um, uh, a university in Canada, uh, well, you know, they had the same concerns, asked a research firm in France to do uh, a pretty extensive study, a cause relational study, as well as looking at the ingredients, uh, breakdown of the tires, and just found no, no carcinogens that would be involved in causing cancer. So just want to relieve that uh, for you. The other question that really has come up, or maintenance, so oh, yeah put it in, $5.2 million, uh, how are you gonna maintain it? Well, and that's where the rentals come in. The uh, um, finance department here has done a pretty extensive job visiting with uh, Dones in the Twin Cities and in Rochester about what it takes to maintain it and what it takes to replace the materials. And uh, if you rent at the facility at about 50% of the time, you more than pay for uh, the maintenance costs and the replacement costs. We're hoping to get at the Rochester rents at about 75% of the available times, and we believe that we're gonna be able to get that also. As Laura pointed out, we started getting phone calls almost immediately uh, after it was announced in uh, October, 
and uh, we already have our <coughs> bookings now and we haven't even built it yet. So people uh, want to use it. And then you look at the community benefits. Um, as I'm out and about in the community, you get, uh, you know, people are proud of Austin schools. We're obviously proud of Austin schools. And we know the type of job that we do. But we're, we're viewed most of the time as takers. Takers from the community. Takers of the resources in the community. Tax dollars, revenue. You take students. Sometimes you do good with them. Sometimes you don't. And here's an opportunity to partner with the community to provide not only something good for our kids, but good for the community as a whole. So we think it's, it's a good positive relationship. And it goes along with all the other partnerships we, we do have uh, with the community. So that's, that's kind of uh, the questions we've had. What do you guys have for questions for us?